I'm going to start this talk uh, with uh, a couple of memories of Milan. Uh, I was at primary school here, in, uh, just near Corso Magenta, and Itali 46 Italian girls in one, you know, scuola elementare, primary school. And uh, sometimes people say to me, why did you become interested in addictions? You've spent your whole life treating and studying addiction. And the first thing that comes to mind is walking to school the first years, and this is the 70s, this is the, the mid 70s, the early 70s, walking to primary school, and along the street were lots of heroin addicts crouching against the car tires. Now, only people my age or older will remember this, but Milan was full of people injecting, and they had syringes and lemons and spoons, and they were injecting in the street. And my nanny would pull my arm and say, stop looking, and I'd be, but they don't look well. What's happening? Why aren't they being helped? Because then they would lie on the ground, and people will, would walk over them, including me going to school. So that's the first memory, which is a very powerful one. And when I've been interviewed on radio programs in, the, in Britain about my career, that's the thing that I start talking about. The other one is that we used to go and play games because there was not much green around in the center of Milan, in Parco Simpione, where before starting to play football, we would collect bloody syringes lots of them, 10, 20 at a time, because in the morning, in the afternoons after school, it would be us, but at night, it would be the heroin addicts using to inject there. So, you know, that's my history, really. And uh, the sad bit about this history is that quite a few of my friends who were growing up in the 70s in Milan became heroin addicts. And the question for me was always, why some people and why not others? And now we have some of these incredible research uh, to show us why some people are more vulnerable genetically or environmentally than others. Okay, so uh, I, I've been introduced already, so I won't go through much else, but th there is a, one of my roles is to advise the British government on um, pathological gambling in terms of responsibilities. And uh, I would say that uh, when we talk about what needs to be done next, uh, my t I have a talk tomorrow about my clinic, really. This is more about addiction, uh, pathological gambling in general. But there is a major piece of work to be done in terms of taking governments to take up responsibility for what is happening to the uh, hundreds of thousands of pathological gamblers who are being in some way exposed to uh, far too many environmental cues linked to gambling. That is my message for you today. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to look at a uh, historical look at gambling. I'm going to look at definitions and clinical presentations in a briefer way in order to have more time to talk to you about the neurobiological side of things and um, uh, neuropsychological tests, some neuroimaging, and then uh, a little bit about medication. I'm very excited. We've just started medication uh, uh, and, uh, at the clinic, uh, and I want to tell you about, about that. Uh, so this is, a, this is a song. I won't sing it, but it's all about gambling and what happens if you become a pathological gambler. And essentially, it goes like this. One day, it's milk and honey. Next day, hustling around for money. Every gambling man he knows, easy comes and easy goes. One day you're one great big winner, the next day you haven't got your dinner. 
And when you die, there's a fuel sigh for a gambling man. Essentially, you mess up your life pretty badly if you go down that route. And isolation and the cutoff from people around you, family and friends, is one of the most serious consequences, apart from losing all your money, of course. So in ICD-10, it's still under impulse control disorder. I'm part of the WHO group. We're working towards deciding where to place this, uh, this di disorder because actually in DSM-5, it's now with addictions, as a lot of you will know. How many people are actually experiencing problems in the UK in terms of gambling? Well, for the last decade, it has been fluctuating between 0.6% using the same methodological screening, that's in the year 2000 and in the year 2007. And then in 2012, we saw an increase to 0.9%. If you think that uh, affordability and availability are two of the things that really determine how much people do something. And we know now that there is a lot of availability of gambling in the UK, then we can understand how as the income for the gambling industry increased, uh, more people were carrying out these activities, more vulnerabilities were exposed. But what happened later was very interesting. They changed the methodology of the prevalence study and it became impossible, therefore, to compare like with like. So now it would seem, according to published government figures, then the prev that the prevalence is now 0.5. The problem is it's not measuring the same thing and it's very difficult, therefore, to know. And one of my big last gestures having uh, being about to step off the gambling the gambling board for the government after seven years is to try and persuade people that reintroducing the old screening tool one more time after the gambling act was introduced which allowed thousands more gambling machines would give us a realistic and fair understanding of the problem um, in terms of children, uh, Category D machines are legal for children to play. And what does that do in terms of neuronal circuitry? Does this in some way act as a gateway to enjoying gambling activities at, late, at a later age? Well, possibly yes. That's another issue that one needs to think about. And we know problem gamblers are more likely to be male of a younger age and have parents who gamble regularly or were problem gamblers. And th there is a, gen a strong genetic component to this. There is also a strong environmental component as, of course, if you grow up in a house where uh, emotional love, maternal, paternal love is expressed by taking you to Las Vegas on holiday or spending the weekend at the races with you or giving you money to gamble, it's going to be hard to extricate the gambling from uh, positive emotional feelings. There was a further survey in 2012, uh, which again was quite similar in terms of 0.8. This too was an extra survey, not the original, but I thought it was fair to include that. We know that people have been gambling forever, really. Uh, Egyptians used to use knuckle bones as dice, and we have images of those, and we know that it goes as far back as that. And certainly the first roulette games were dating back to 1,500. Now, um, interestingly, uh, roulette games are the thing that I find the most addictive as the director of the National Problem Gambling Clinic in the UK. We have roughly 1,000 referrals a year and either people arrive and they're already playing roulette games online or in bookmakers or they start playing them, graduating onto them from playing sports games. So there is something about the nature of the game that is important if you're interested in what kinds of things are addictive. <clears throat> How do we define pathological gambling? 
The best way to see it is a persistent and recurrent maladaptive gambling behavior that disrupts personal, family, or vocational pursuits. The preoccupation with gambling is important. And what I mean is, you wake up in the morning and instead of thinking about what shall I have for breakfast, or like me, I can't wait for my cappuccino, now I'm in Milan, you think, what shall I gamble on today? How do I get the money to go and do the gambling? And then all you think about is uh, the activity. You get to do the gambling, you spend hours and hours there, or less if you lose all your money, and then after you've gambled, you think about what you did, and how it felt, and how sad you are now you have no money, or how happy you are now that you have lots of money. So essentially, preoccupation is a pretty important aspect. Uh, we know that, if you, that pathological gamblers tend to start much earlier than regular gamblers, and that again may have something to do with the family context, or the, but also possibly the genetic predisposition and impulsivity, which we find um, fundamental within the context of the presentation, and I will talk about that a little bit later. Restlessness and irritability very similar to the presentation in other addictions. Yes, when you try and cut down or stop, it becomes very difficult to think about anything else. Or, and if people tell you that you are doing something too much and you should stop, you start moving away from them or criticizing them. And using gambling to escape dysphoric states and psychological discomfort is common. And some of the very tragic stories that I hear on a, on a daily basis in my clinic are about people who were escaping extremely hard family, early life experiences, or indeed school ones. There, there is often emotional abuse, there is frequently physical or sexual abuse, there is bullying at school, there is parents who are unable to provide emotionally because of a sick sibling, of a dead sibling. There are all sorts of horrendous stories and they do make up quite a large component of personal histories um, about gambling. Although when you're thinking about the sort of three pathway models that Blazinski set out, we certainly do have one particular type of patient who is male, who is in their 20s, and who is extremely sensation-seeking, extremely impulsive. And those are the types of people for whom medication starts to come um, into our minds quite, quite early. Concealing the extent of one's gambling from therapists, from relatives and friends, again, is shared with our addictions. It is definitely something we see a lot of, particularly because uh, the losses involved are major. Uh, you know, I come across people who, I often, not even sometimes, come across people who have lost their family home and haven't told their wife yet that in a month's time, they will be homeless. They, their children, will be homeless. Sometimes I've seen people who've taken their parents' money from the parents' account, all their savings, their life savings, they've stolen it, and they haven't told their parents that it's all gone, and it, they're about to be homeless themselves. So these are the extreme, this is the extreme side of problem gambling, and why when society looks at it and talks about a weakness of character, that's when also it's time to stand up and say pathological gambling is one more addiction and addiction is an illness. So motivation to gamble becomes uh, less prevalent and in terms of the winning the money, so you want to gamble but you don't want to do it for the money any longer because what people tell me is that the money becomes a burden because people know they're going to have to be longer at the machines to get rid of it. So they know, they learn that in terms of their own behavior, it's actually uh, a never-ending cycle of despair. Uh, they stop enjoying it, but they still need to do it. Uh, I've talked about DSM-5 and the fact that it's now with the substance-related and addictive disorders from 2013. Um, I won't go through all of these just because I've given you most of the criteria already. Um, uh, the increasing amounts is important because it has a 
connection with tolerance. So in the way you would increase your drug use or the amounts of alcohol you drink, in this case you're increasing either the amounts that you're spending or you're increasing the amount of time you are spending gambling instead of getting on with your normal life, which may be uh, working, being a parent, whatever else you were expected to be doing or used to enjoy doing in the past. Now, chasing losses is one other thing that is really um, uh, connected to problem gambling as a diagnosis. What I mean by this is that if I go, I don't, I don't actually personally gamble, I don't find it enjoyable, but say that I did go today at lunchtime and spent uh, 300 pounds or 300 euros on gambling, having lost it all, I would then say, oh gosh, that was a bad uh, lunchtime, I'll go back to the conference and learn about psychiatry. But someone with a vulnerability to pathological gambling would say, oh my God, I've lost 300 euros. I'm going to stay here and I'm going to get it back. I won't leave this place until I get my 300 euros back. And by 3 a.m. at night, tomorrow, they'll still be there trying to get their money back. And that's the difference, really. Um, okay, so relying on others is important. People lose their money. They start borrowing from other people. Once they've borrowed and lost their friends, they start to steal it. 84% of my patients have taken money from other people. They've, uh, from work, a lot of the time from work, people end up in positions of responsibility. They're high functioning addicts, pathological gamblers. So they go and work in a pub, they end up managing the till. They go and work for a shop, they end up managing the till, and then they start taking from the till. So one of the things we always, always tell our patients is give up this job, change this job, or explain to them you can't be doing this, you have to do something where there's no access. We call it stimulus control. There is no access to the cash, therefore you can't gamble. Um, episodic or persistent uh, is, a, is, is obviously one of the definitions that, uh, that is important when you're diagnosing. Um, I must say, uh, most of the people we see are continuous, um, actually. And then according to the criteria, you are mild, moderate, or severe. Um, there's an association, yeah, so it's, I'm not talking about causation, but there's an association with gender, with men uh, having more problems, uh, with age, with young people uh, being more likely to experience problems. And um, in the UK, children have four times the prevalence of problem gambling. We're doing a big study now with a think tank that our Prime Minister Cameron is using to advise on policy and uh, uh, we are going to try and do some large prevalence studies to see whether it really is four times. It feels incredibly high, but every time someone does a small study, they come up with this figure. Um, and there are reasons for that which I will go into. There are neurobiological reasons which I will talk about in a minute. Um, homelessness, we did the first UK study on homelessness and pathological gambling, and we found that the prevalence is 10 times that of uh, the general population. Now, partly that's because when people lose all their money, they become homeless. That's the easy bit in terms of directionality. As they're homeless, then, you know, that's it. We know where that continuity goes. But the other way around is that homeless people in London uh, don't quite know what to do with themselves all day. There aren't enough structures to entertain them, to get them back into work, to look after them properly. So they go into bookmakers to keep warm, to meet other people, to feel part of something that is not just being vulnerable and on the streets. And when they're in the bookmakers, they need to gamble, otherwise they can't stay there all day. So that's a worrying trend that we've noticed. Other associated problems, employment, crime, physical health, social isolation, 
and uh, pressures on family and carers, big pressures. At our clinic, we have a parallel stream of treatment that is absolutely dedicated to family members, and we have uh, developed a manual to help support them through the various stages of freeing themselves from the pressures that can lead relatives themselves to become suicidal as well as uh, the patients. And that's, that's working well. We've got an association with impulsivity, a strong predictor of problems at a young age and high levels of impulsivity in our patient population. So, you know, we know that, that children at the age of seven who have like, high levels of impulsivity have a much higher uh, possibility of becoming pathological gamblers. Uh, impaired functioning brain regions that relate to decision making. Again, obviously it does make sense, but it's really important to go through this. Uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex and striatum, these are the reward pathway areas that are showing significant differences between pathological gamblers and controls. When we look at the reward deficiency hypothesis, states that susceptibility to addiction stems from insensitive dopamine system if you have a hypoactive reward system, you require stronger stimuli to activate the reward systems. And to support this, PET studies have shown that addicted individuals release less dopamine in response to drug administration than, than controls. And this is Nora Volkov's wonderful work, uh, which has been going on through the years, and it's great that um, uh, she's interested in behavioral addictions as much as in the original drugs and alcohol field. Uh, there's fMRI data mixed with some studies showing lower striatal response during reward anticipation tasks than in controls, whereas others report enhanced striatal response. We have a, we're in a very early stage here with pathological gambling. It is it's like being in the 1950s in a way, in terms of where alcohol used to be, um, or, or drug research. So we need, to, we need to replicate what's been happening in the drugs field and find answers by doing more randomized controlled trials. So when we look at neurotransmitters, we've got um, dopamine linked to reward processing and reinforcement, and there are studies to show elevated levels of dopamine metabolites um, observed in problem gamblers versus controls. We know dopamine increases uh, have been observed during gambling. D2 dopamine antagonists linked to increased gambling motivations in problem gambling. All this is important because actually we can get to a point where dose-related responses can be also used to track effectiveness of treatment, for example. And when we look at D2 dopamine agonists like aripiprazole, um, well, in this case, it's a partial agonist. We know that some schizophrenics coming to the clinic are showing up with pathological gambling problems that didn't exist before. They only started after the medication was commenced. Can I just check? Can you put your hand up if you've ever seen a schizophrenic who started gambling after using aripiprazole? One over there. Two three, four, five, six, seven, okay, eight. Right, that's, that's great, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, but, but why that should be, why that mechanism should be, I am not quite clear. So uh, I think a lot of work needs to take place in terms of this. We have serotonin studies, they're less interesting in a way in terms of pathological gambling research at the moment, and actually, when we look at the SSRI studies with pathological gamblers, it would have been great if we could have shown that uh, giving an SSRI sorts out the problem because they're available, they're easy to tolerate, GPs give them out, you don't need specialist clinics. But what we find is that, yes, of course, if you're very depressed and you're gambling because you're very depressed after a bereavement, you may be one of the few people that as you come out of a depressive episode, you may not gamble anymore. But really, this isn't where it's all at, particularly. Um, 
nor necessarily is the arousal and excitement area, despite having found elevated levels in problem gamblers uh, uh, in relation to PGs. Although, again, we, may need, we certainly need more work in this area as well to say that for sure that is not the right avenue in terms of research. When we look at neural systems, Potenza, Mark Potenza from Yale, he's one of the real gurus in this area and actually he, he was instrumental in helping me set up this first national clinic uh, because uh, he was able to really give a lot of advice in terms of all the aspects of the illness uh, that needed to be taken care of. But we are looking at uh, less uh, bold signal changes in frontal cortical, basal ganglia, and thalamic brain regions in problem gamblers watching images of gambling compared to regular gamblers. The low signals were especially in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex area. The several studies have replicated this. And as you remember, this was one of the areas that I personally am very, very interested in because of the delayed gratification impairment that is so fundamental in addictions as a whole and present also in this group of people. Why is pathological gambling important at a neurobiological level? Because it's a natural addiction and I think it holds some of the key answers in terms of understanding addiction to substances and to alcohol. If there are predisposing brain abnormalities, predisposing uh, impaired circuits that uh, need to be looked at to understand alcohol and drug use at pathological levels, they will probably lie within the gambling field. It is linked to risky decision making. Um, Problem gamblers place higher wages on simple probability decisions, less likely to choose delayed rewards over immediate gratification, and they have problems learning advantageous tactics for future rewards. And there's a very exciting uh, neuropsychiatric computerized test uh, called the IOVA gambling task by Bishara, sometimes called the Bishara Gambling Task, where you have a set of deck of cards and you have to choose the advantageous cards over the disadvantageous ones in order to get money rather than lose money. And you know, I have yet to meet any problem gambler who kind of gets that game and it manages to end up in the green rather than in the red. So to me, if there's one test that is going to sort you out in terms of whether you have a problem or not, or whether you're at risk of having a problem, much more interesting, um, that's the one. When we look at white matter abnormalities, uh, in substance misuse, brain matter, brain matter, white matter integrity abnormalities have been shown. Now, in 2011, we started seeing them in problem gamblers. And although there were no volumetric differences um, between problem gamblers and controls, abnormal white matter in corpus callosum and superior longitudinal fasciculum was similar to substance misuse findings. And don't forget, this was all before the two, 2013 shift in DSM. So these kinds of studies were important, even though there were not enough of them, uh, in, and, and they weren't sort of significant numbers enough. They still helped sort of shift our, uh, our ideas. Um, is it a consequence of the addiction or a predisposing marker? More research is needed, although we know with internet addiction disorder that white matter abnormalities do reverse. Um, and and uh, if you go from 14 hours a day to no uh, hours of gaming, S some of those will actually reverse, which is important. So we're talking about immediate reward gratification and impaired functioning. Uh, ventral striatum under activation in problem gamblers is consistent with results in other addictions such as alcohol and cocaine. Now, what do we do to treat these patients? Well, the evidence base is there for cognitive behavioral therapy. And we at the clinic, at the National Problem Gambling Clinic, started by delivering nine sessions of CBT in a manualized way. We've expanded Nancy Petrie's uh, work with her collaboration, and we have seen that that worked extremely well. We then saw that uh, new research showed that 
for a lot of people, group therapy of a CBT kind worked. And I was in a position where I had the same funding I had for 200 people, and then I had 1,000 people, and I thought I need to do something. So I then expanded the treatment, and the majority of our patients actually get treated in a group setting unless they have a significant mental illness such as schizophrenia, um, in which case we have either individual work or small groups, or sometimes these people are uh, finding problems speaking English and they need an interpreter, in which case they go into one-to-one. -one. Now, in, in the USA, there is more of a 12-step approach as well as CBT and GA, Gamblers Anonymous, is, is big there. Uh, in England, it's here, but it's not as, it's, it is in England too, but not as big. So uh, with some evidence of naltrexone working from colleagues across the, the world, really, um, uh, I was very excited to, to start. And I've got, I've got some uh, slides to show you later. So a couple of months ago, we began the treatment. And I was saying in a session earlier this morning that having only just started treating patients at my clinic after nearly a decade of running this national clinic, started giving them medication because the regulations are so tight in, in the UK. Uh, what is licensed? Well, naltrexone is not licensed for pathological gambling, so I had to prescribe it off-label. Off-label, but not as part of a randomized controlled trial, so it was particularly difficult, but I have permission to do that now. And uh, the newspapers, the Times in particular, heard about this and went crazy. So a week ago, it was all over the front page of the national newspapers, uh, doctor in national clinic prescribing naltrexone, and they got, they, they got the, medic the costs wrong, and they said that it cost 10,000 pounds per patient per year to treat. And this was a disaster clinically, because actually it's very cheap, as you heard earlier. And, um, and to treat someone is literally about 300 pounds a year. But this, this political, or I don't know whether it was politically done or whether it was genuinely a mistake on the part of the journalist, meant, first of all, I had hundreds of people uh, contacting us in the last week wanting treatment. But I also had a lot of um, politicians getting in touch. Is it true it costs this much money? How can the NHS, which is without any money, tr no money to treat alcohol, no money to treat mental health, why do you think you can spend money on treating gamblers? So it was a, a, a positive and a negative thing that the media covered it. But certainly, this is what we are doing. Just a little word on adolescent brains. Um, as they mature, they gradually become able to make, uh, to, uh, so they become able to a greater or lesser extent to resist impulses and to make advantageous choices by disregarding immediate rewards. So you can say no to a joint. You can say no to staying out all night if you have to, an exam in the morning. And the greater gains are exactly that, that academic accomplishment or being there for your family when they expect you to be at home rather than out at night, etc. And we know that the adolescents who have these four times the rates of problem gambling uh, have a propensity for risk-taking, sensation-seeking, there is emotional volatility there, a greater autonomic and neuroendocrine reactivity to stress, and increased cognitive disruption during stress. And these are all factors that will really impact on the higher levels. Um, I've included here the Cambridge Gamble task because it's one I love. It's actually a bad slide because there's a little bit missing, but this is what is being used uh, in one of our, in, well, in various pieces of our research to look at whether you're able to postpone gratification and use odds and, and whether actually instead you're being impulsive and the black uh, square with the numbers, that is both in ascending and in descending order in a very 
elegant, elegant study by Rogers originally uh, in Barbara Sahakian's group in Cambridge so that you can make a decision about where the uh, gold square lies, whether it's under red or under blue squares, and then you can say how sure you are of that decision. Now, when I first became interested in gambling, the reason why I became interested that if you can imagine this screen and imagine that there is one red square and nine blue ones, and I would sit with somebody and I would say, now, tell me, where do you think the gold square is? under blue or red, and then if you think it's under blue, you, s you press blue, if you think it's under red, you press red. And they'd go, red doctor, red. And I'd go, well, you've got a one in 10 chance of it being under that. Why do you think so? Doctor, I've just got this gut feeling. I just know it's going to be under there. And of course, they were really wrong. But that was the way I started to identify this, uh, I guess, cognitive distortions is the term we use uh, scientifically when we talk about our gamblers, and an overconfidence in their abilities too. Um, okay, back to adolescent brains, just to talk about, and all of you will know this, being a psychiatric conference, uh, there is this uh, a maturation of the brain in ratio to white matter to gray matter, back to front, you've got the prefrontal cortex being the last to mature, and this does have some significant consequences. Some of them are great in terms of allowing the human race to progress, and others on an individual basis are not so uh, advantageous. Uh, I'll talk uh, just very briefly about impulsivity because I, I don't want to run out of time, but just to let you know, this image is of a quilt, an American quilt, uh, done by a neuroscientist in the States. Um, and I have a whole collection of these rather interesting images on my blog called theartofscience.com. So if you like science and you like art, you can look on there and you'll find the reference to who did this. I think it's rather beautiful. Um, so when you look at impulsivity, we've heard today it's a fundamental uh, component of pathological gambling uh, uh, brain dysfunction, a predisposition towards rapid, unplanned reactions to internal or external stimuli without regard to the negative consequences of these reactions to the impulsive individual or others, fundamental. Um, it's currently viewed as a collection of separate constructs. Hypothetical concepts of impulsivity have been studied using a series of different self-report measures, and these, a Barrett and a UPPSP, are still two that we are using a lot unless you move on to the neuropsych um, touch screens. And I won't go into this now, but this is an explanation. It's a very, very good uh, scale. Uh, but I'll tell you why I've included it now, um, because uh, of the um, uh, urgency that I'll talk about in a second. So laboratory-based neuropsychological measures have also been used. I talked about the over-gambling task, the go-no-go -no -go task, and the stop signal reaction time. Most studies have found positive associations between certain impulsivity traits and problem gambling, uh, although different measures and subjects were used. Pathological gamblers scored higher on subscales of impulsivity, and here it is, negative urgency and positive urgency. So when you're feeling low, you gamble to escape that negative mood, and when you're feeling high, you gamble to celebrate that feeling of being high. And actually, when you think about it, uh, alcoholism uh, has some similarities, but it's good for us to have this kind of data, and you've got the lack of perseverance uh, as well. Um, of special interest, in a sample of 84 subjects comprising at-risk and pathological gamblers, UPPSP urgency score was found to be significantly correlated with greater pathological gambling severity, while the other subscales were not. And here's a Barrett, I won't go into that, and these are other impulsivity uh, studies. It's all about delay discount discounting, and uh, again, ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, stop signal task, impulsive action, 
or lack of motor inhibition was correlated to the severity of presentation of pathological gamblers. So eventually, I would love to get to a point where people can take this test. We're now working with the government on this large-scale population test for a uh, group with, of young people. If only these young people knew that they were vulnerable to becoming problem gamblers, because of a very quick test they might be able to do within their school um, general education sessions, uh, the more we might protect families and the kids of pathological gamblers in particular, in particular who are growing up in very unsafe homes with domestic violence, with split families, with no homes, uh, and we will be able to improve on a large scale the quality of life of a vast amount of the British population. Um, electronic gaming machines have been suggested to be associated with greater severity, and I've talked a bit about that earlier, so I won't dwell on this. Uh, I'll just finish by mentioning a study we have just published in Neuropsychopharmacology. This is the Imperial College group that I belong to. The study was actually, first author was Inge Mick, who st spent a lot of time at my clinic, and Anne Linkford Hughes, who is a professor of neuropsychopharmacology, was a lead author of this study. And the title was Blunted Endogenous Opioid Release Following Oral Amphetamine Challenge in Pathological Gamblers. Our previous speaker will be interested in uh, uh, maybe having a look at this, because I, I think it might lead us to think about future collaboration in this area. Um, so these include clinical etiological features such as, abno sorry, what, what have I done? One second. Yeah. Let me just get. Um, so the pathophysiology within the opioid receptor system is increasingly recognized in addictions. Higher uh, mu opioid receptor availability reported alcohol, cocaine, and opiate addiction. Um, higher availability is associated with cravings. Um, uh, mu opioid receptors have a key role in mediating rewarding effects of opiates, and most dense in the basal ganglia, thalamus, and amygdala. Impulsivity, as mentioned before, has been associated with higher availability. This was the first ever study in the world to characterize these uh, MOR availability in pathological gamblers. And don't forget, all the time we're trying to understand this disease, this addiction, in relation to general addictions, where all of this work has been done. So it was also the first study to assess endogenous opioid release in problem gamblers using carfentanil PET with oral amphetamine challenge. It's a selective MR agonist radioligand, and we, there were 14 problem gamblers, 15 volunteers underwent uh, carfentanil PET scans before and after administration of amphetamine. The change in carfentanil binding between baseline and post-amphetamine scans was assessed in 10 regions of the brain. And mu opioid receptor availability did not differ between problem gamblers and healthy volunteers. Well, this is very interesting to us and not necessarily an ideal result. We don't know whether it can be replicated or not, uh, but it was an unexpected result. However, problem gamblers demonstrated significant blunting of opioid release compared with healthy volunteers after amphetamine administration. This is in line with other addictions and a really key result, which would have been very helpful at the time of DSM-5, making choices about where to put the illness, but it certainly will be uh, a study that we will be bringing to the WHO's attention uh, when uh, the time comes in Hong Kong in September. Okay, the last thing, problem gamblers showed blunted amphetamine-induced euphoria and alertness compared to healthy volunteers. It is the first evidence of blunted endogenous opioid release in problem gamblers and are consistent with growing evidence that dysregulation of these endogenous opioids may have an important role in the pathophysiology of addictions. I've talked about the clinic, so I won't go into this any longer. I'm talking about it tomorrow. I've talked about the treatment, and um, I will discuss it further later. We are prescribing naltrexone. Patients are responding to it very well. They talk about a switch being turned off. 
and they have time to think about their work, they have time to think about their studies. We have only just started. It's not an RCT, a randomized controlled trial, but it is what we are seeing in clinic every day with our patients. We're not using nalmefine. I included this here because I felt I should, but I'm running out of time, and therefore, I will now come to the end. Uh, there is evidence, uh, although um, only not too strong, but there's enough evidence to say that naltrexone should be used in order uh, to treat pathological gamblers well and correctly. This is our book, and this is Nancy Petrie's book. They're both on gambling and behavioral addictions. And if anyone wants to visit me in London at my clinic, I'd be delighted. I have a whole stream of Italian uh, postdocs and uh, psychiatric trainees coming through doing really good research and I absolutely love having, uh, having them uh, work with us. Thank you.